thank you for the kind of introduction, uh, Michael. It wasn't nearly that hard. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's the weather here. It's 45 degrees in Iowa. <laughs> um, it was not nearly as difficult. But um, the show of hands real quick, how many people have seen that video he was just talking about? Okay, cool. So I'm not going to bore you with why I'm here then. Um, you know why I'm here. <laughs> um, seven months ago, uh, after that, that, uh, that hearing, um, it, it kind of got out of control. Uh, that was on a Monday night, and by Wednesday, I was booked on three national television programs. By Friday, the video had a million hits on YouTube, and it, you guys just turned my life upside down. Um, but you know, I was okay with that. Uh, you know, so I spent the last seven months kind of going all over the country talking about uh, how boring it is to have two gay moms and how overwhelmingly normal <laughs> our lives have been, which makes for a pretty uninteresting talk. Um, so I have to tell the jokes most of the time. Um, but usually, uh, there, there are four big questions I get whenever uh, people find out that I've got gay moms. Um, you know, depending on, on where I'm at or, or how comfortable they are with the subject, the first question is always, dude, are they hot? Or, um, you know, what's wrong with you? Uh, and, and, and luckily the answer to both questions is, is no, uh, I like to think anyway. Um, but, you know, the biggest difference, you know, I have to, and that's the question I get a lot, what's the biggest difference growing up with two moms? Um, I'm really good at putting the seat down. And, <laughs> and evidently, it's kind of a big deal or something. Um, so that's, that's really the biggest. Now, although, I'm also uh, not afraid to stop and ask for directions when my smartphone dies. Um, so th those are really the two biggest ones that I, I get. Uh, people often ask me, well, Zach, then are you gay? Um, no. Uh, hanging out with tall people doesn't make you tall. Uh, having gay friends doesn't make you gay. That's not how it works. Um, another common one is, which one is the man? I actually had, uh, I was having dinner with an ex-girlfriend and her mom, we were just having dinner. She's like, so Zach, which one's the man? And she's like smiling her face, really kind-hearted woman, just didn't understand uh, the nuances, I think, of LGBT relationships. And I had to explain, you know, my girlfriend is just like choking on her food, you know, oh my God. Um, and I just, you know, it's kind of like walking into a Chinese restaurant and asking which chopstick is the fork. Uh, this is not really how it works. Um, I often, often get, well then what do you call it? Uh, and I think it's actually a pretty good question. Uh, I've got uh, a handful of friends who also have two moms or two dads. Um, and one of my friends calls both of her moms by their first name. Um, for me, it was always Mom and Jackie uh, because my tall mom, Terry, um, my biological mom, uh, had me when she was still single. She didn't meet Jackie until I was about five. So by that point, I was already calling her mom, and then for clarity's sake, it was mom and Jackie from that point out. Um, and then the last question I always get is, Zach, what's it like growing up with two gay moms? And that one's, uh, that one's a little bit more complicated. Um, I was the result of in vitro fertilization. Uh, it's a reproductive technology that's used to, most commonly uh, to help women who have uh, scarred in their fallopian tubes to have, get pregnant and give birth to kids. And it's interesting to note, actually, uh, that Terry, my biological mom, uh, had scarring in her fallopian tubes and wouldn't have been able to conceive naturally, um, even if she had been straight and married to a man. Um, I was actually, <laughs> it's cool that I know this, conceived in probably the gayest place in the world, um, Casher Avenue in San Francisco. Um, on Halloween night, so my mom was surrounded by drag queens. Uh, and even though this most auspicious of nights, I um, was conceived, and uh, then she came back home uh, to, we were living in Wisconsin, or she was living in Wisconsin at the time, um, had me, and then nine months later had a you know, screaming baby boy. Um, and then the newspaper refused to run her birth, my birth announcement. Uh, she wasn't very happy about that, so she thought maybe there was a mistake, you know, Process. There's a lot of babies being born in this hospital. It's the biggest one in the state. Uh, so she called them up and she uh, got the editor on the phone and the editor explained, oh no, I'm sorry, we don't do illegitimate children. Um, she wasn't very happy about that. So she uh, told them, well, all right, they'll be hearing from my lawyer. They called her right back um, and then said, you know, we'll, uh, you know we'll, we'll run this announcement. She said, you know, I, I think that you should change your policy. And they're like, oh, come on. <laughs> 
she's always been a pain in the ass. <laughs> Especially about the things that matter most. Um, so eventually the newspaper changed their policy, ran the birth announcement, and that was kind of my baptism by fire into this whole talking about my family thing, I suppose. Uh, she had my sister, Zebby, from the same uh, sperm donor, actually, uh, three years later in 1994. And then she met Jackie, uh, my short mom, in 95. Uh, she's like, actually, she's like five, too. Um, so there's a, and, and, uh, and Terry's like five alive. So there's a, there's a noticeable difference. Um, and it's clear which one's my biological mom. Um, but they had a commitment ceremony in 1996, because uh, this, and it was three months to the day, actually, that the Defense of Marriage Act was signed into law by President Clinton. Um, you know, and that was a time when uh, you know, gay marriage wasn't even on the radar and civil unions were an interesting idea. And if you look, you know, uh, 15 years later, how far we've come, I think it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, you know, I remember when they actually, they legalized, uh, and I'll get to this later, but when they legalized marriage, um, same-sex marriage in Iowa, you know, Terry just couldn't believe it, you know, uh, thinking about what had happened since I've been born and, and where things were today. Um, but then we did move to Iowa in 2000 from Wisconsin, uh, and it was in that same year that uh, Terry uh, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which is not an autoimmune disease, and if anybody in the room has a family member or friend who has MS, uh, you know how uh, destructive uh, it is. Um, and and I, I like to, you know, looking back on my life now, I, I realize that it was really my mom's MS diagnosis that affected my life uh, in profoundly more ra ways than the fact that I had lesbian parents or that I had two moms. Um, if you look at all of the things that really shaped me and made me who I am today, it was really having to deal with this crippling disease that you know, turned this former world-class athlete into a woman who spent uh, 16 hours a day in a wheelchair. Um, that really, uh, it was overcoming those challenges, and that ever the challenges of having two moms or having gay moms, you know, that, that really, those paled in comparison um, to the other uh, health real health issues uh, that we had to deal with. Um, but by 2009, uh, she, she was slowly on the upswing, um, which is something that you know, to this day we're all very happy about. Uh, but it was in 2009 that the Iowa Supreme Court re uh, ruled in a unanimous decision that uh, Iowa's legislative ban on same-sex marriage was unconstitutional and violated the Iowa Constitution's Equal Protection Clause, clearing the way for same-sex marriages uh, three weeks later. Um, and I then, I was the columns editor for my high school newspaper at the time, and I wrote a column that I then, uh, a whim, submitted to uh, the state's largest newspaper, and that kind of got me on the radar uh, of this, uh, the state's largest uh, LGBT advocacy organization. And then, um, two years later, uh, this past January, um, and Clark, I appreciated your comments. Uh, this is one place I will have to disagree, though. Um, in Iowa, the, the election uh, in 2010, obviously, didn't go the way that we were hoping it would. Uh, Iowans voted out of office three of the Supreme Court justices who were up for retention votes. Then elected into office in the House a uh, large Republican majority, and in the Senate uh, the Democrats had a one-seat uh, majority. And, and the frustrating part was even of those 51 Democrats, we didn't know if all of them were going to support uh, marriage equality in Iowa and actually hold the line. So there was this hearing. Uh, the, the Republicans in the Iowa House Ways in No Time in putting together House Joint Resolution 6. That was uh, Martin Lee. It's always like the most ominous names. Uh, <laughs> House Joint Resolution 6, House Bill 74. Um, but HJR 6 was quickly passed out of committee um, by uh, the Republicans in the committee with the party line vote. Um, and then, because there was such vast public interest in, in, this, uh, in this bill, they decided to hold a public hearing. And that was when uh, one Iowa, the uh, state's largest LGBT organization, reached out to me and asked me to speak at this hearing. Um, and I was like, uh, let me find somebody else to work for me that night. Um, I did, uh, <laughs> which was good. Um, and, and so I managed to make it to the hearing, and uh, I said my piece, and I thought that was it. Um, nope. <laughs> uh, the, the House Democrats put a video of the, the, the clip on, on YouTube. Um, and then it kind of went crazy. Um, but the, the bill passed the House. Uh, it was a party line vote with three Democrats joining all the Republicans. Uh, and it went on to the Iowa Senate, uh, where it was then uh, defeated. Uh, not because there was, never came up for a vote. Uh, because Democrats held the majority, the Democratic majority leader got to set the agenda. <coughs> we found out uh, after this, the session was over uh, that he had two members in his caucus who would have 
voted for the amendment uh, to move forward to vote for the people uh, to come up for a vote. So that was that was one time where, uh, unfortunately, party politics um, probably did save uh, gay marriage in Iowa. <clears throat> the last seven months have been a little crazy. Um, I've been kind of all over the place, uh, talking, writing, and, uh, and sharing my story. And I've had this unique opportunity and privilege to do so. And what I've realized is that even though we've had all these incredible successes, uh, the protecting marriage equality in Iowa, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, the Obama administration announcing that they're not going to continue to uh, protect DOMA, this isn't a sprint through the finish. Um, it really is just a mile marker in the marathon. And what I've also realized is that you know this fight isn't over uh, when you secure marriage equality like we did in Iowa. And the fight isn't over when here in Florida, eventually, uh, you know, you uh, elect a legislative body that will advance these kinds of rights and protections. Uh, the fight really is going to be over when the other side realizes that it can't win elections by playing politics with human rights and civil liberties. And to get to that point, what we have to do is continue to educate people. Now, advocacy is important, but action is how we rise. And so what I would humbly suggest everybody in this room consider doing is sometime in the next couple months, invite over for dinner a straight couple, a straight family that you might not see eye to eye with. Just have them over for dinner. No, don't talk about politics. Don't talk about religion. Turn off your cell phones. Um, just have dinner. Get to know them. And have them get to know you. And I think it'll be these kinds of dinner conversations where people will just sit down and break bread, which <laughs> has been an American tradition since before there were American traditions. Um, I think it's going to be these kinds of conversations and just getting to know people. And, and, and you, know, you can call it education, you can call it advocacy, but all it really is is, is sharing your story and, and learning another story about you know, uh, your guests. And I think it's going to be <clears throat> ultimately this kind of uh, sharing of, of who we are, where people begin to understand that there's nothing to be afraid of. So I was uh, in a breakout session earlier today. And the thing that we're dealing with isn't hate. We're not confronting ignorance. What we're confronting is fear. And by breaking bread with somebody, by having a conversation, having dinner with somebody, what we can show them is they have nothing to be afraid about. There's nothing to be afraid of. And I think it's going to be um, that kind of action, that kind of advocacy, that kind of advocacy is going to be how we win this fight. And so, um, if anybody has any questions about how boring it is or what it's like growing up with two gay moms, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Anybody? <laughs> awesome, you guys know what's up. Um, with that, uh, I, would, I would simply um, ask that we all remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who told us that the moral arc of the universe is long, but that it bends towards justice. And I would submit that it bends towards justice, not of its own volition, but because the people in this room, this community, uh, puts on its heels and stands up and grabs it and pulls it in the direction of justice. So thank you very much for having me here tonight.